Ah, oh, Energy 808, the cutting edge. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and on the phone with me is Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us from Pro Provision Solar in Hilo, Hawaii. Welcome back to the show, Marco. Well, I'm tempted to break out in song from South Pacific and sing one enchanted morning, but I'm just going to say it is an enchanted Monday morning whenever I get a chance to talk to you, my friend. So thank you so much for having me back. I am thankful. I am thankful that you haven't broke out in song. Uh, but let's, let's move on. There are three things we're going to cover in Energy 808 today. Uh, one is uh, the solar coaster, uh, largely in Oahu, but around the state. Uh, and two is we're going to cover the status of PGV, Puna Geothermal Venture, and future of geothermal in Hawaii, the big, uh, big Island, and maybe more. And the third is the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, how they're doing and how mm, their view of things has affected uh, the movement of renewable energy in the state of Hawaii. So very excited about this. Let's start now. Let's start now, Marco. Let's talk about the solar coaster. And I know that's your term. Well, I can't 100% definitively take ownership of the solar coaster. I just remember using it myself uh, you know, a number of years ago, and whether I saw it used by somebody else or I was very first, I don't know. It's kind of uh, taken on a life of its own, but uh, I, I do find it to be rather descriptive in terms of what we've been experienced uh, what we've been experiencing here in Hawaii in terms of the rooftop solar market. And, You're trying to say um, that it's I mean, been up and down over the past several years, and sometimes fantastic up and sometimes fantastic down. Yeah, and I'm, uh, and I was able to, uh, with the help of my great staff here, you know, we've got uh, data going back to 2011, 2012, so you know, a good chunk of time that we've been able to track and uh, pretty much real time kind of what the, what the solar industry is doing out here. Uh, so we just recently crunched the July numbers for Oahu, and Oahu, of course, is the biggest market in the state. And uh, the good news is that uh, there was a bump uh, last month in terms of PV permits issued by the folks at the Honolulu Department of Planning and Permitting. They issued 369 portable take system permits uh, last month compared to 219 for July of 2018. So that came out to a, uh, an increase of 68%, which was one of the biggest year-over-year -year bumps for a month uh, since the slowing down of the solar coaster. Uh, the total number of PV permits January to July this year compared to the same period last year uh, was up uh, a smaller percentage of 3.6%. And what's uh, been interesting to note is uh, if you uh, look at the, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to post that graphic. Yeah, let's, let's put the, the graphic up. Okay, coaster. this is called 2012 through 2019 Oahu PV permits issue. This is the Department of Planning and Permitting uh, numbers, I guess. Yeah, that uh, this is all open source uh, data. Anybody who has the time and inclination to go through uh, thousands of PDFs can, uh, from, from the county, the city and county of Honolulu, can uh, go ahead and get you know, do the data crunching themselves. But uh, effectively, our boom boom time years uh, for rooftop solar here across the state were between 2012 and 2015, when there was anywhere from 16 to 21,000 photovoltaic system permits uh, issued across the uh, the four counties of the state. And so again, 16 to 21,000, and and the average over the past three years, including 2019. Has been around 5,000, 5,000 plus or minus maybe a couple of hundred. So it appears that we're reaching perhaps kind of a, um, I don't know, a stasis point or a, a place where maybe the new normal is, uh, is certainly significantly down from the old normal of between 16 to 21,000 permits per year, uh, the new normal being around 5,000 PV permits per year across the state. So, uh, so we're looking at this can't. chart, looking at this chart, and looking at these years, and looking at the high years there at the beginning and the stasis years now, last couple of years, um, what, what conclusions would you reach about where we're going on this? Why, why have we had this particular chart? Why has it been like this? And what does it tell us? Oh, those are great questions, Jay. Why has it been this way? Uh, 
you know, in any type of uh, product and service, especially a, which a big ticket item like a photovoltaic system installation, uh, you're going to see an adoption curve with the early adopters, you know, a number of, a small number of early adopters at the beginning of uh, adopting any type of product or service, and then you get a ramp up, you know, kind of bell-shaped curve of more and more people getting on board, so to speak, and then inevitably, especially when you have a finite number of possible consumers of the product, you're going to start getting on the tail end of that, of that uh, graph. And I think one could make the case, at least according to the data that I've been crunching and living and breathing by for the past years, is that in terms of the adoption of rooftop solar, rooftop solar in the state of Hawaii, that uh, as much as I, it hurts me to uh, to observe this, I think we're we're apparently on the tail end of the of the adoption curve. The incentives which existed to allow for substantial ex expansion, like we saw 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, uh, one of the biggest incentives was net energy metering. And that was available in the state from 2001 to 2015, so 14 years. So uh, you can certainly make a correlation observation that when NEM was brought to a close by uh, regulatory fiat in October of 2015, that essentially marked the beginning of the ramp down uh, in terms of adoption. So I think that's an important point, and I think, uh, you know, that. Uh, the the desire of uh, of homeowners to to go PV uh, clearly according to the data have uh, the, the desire has peaked now is it possible to make a case for the desire and the uh, ramp up a significant ramp up over time of the solar coaster I mean I'd love to be able to make the argument yes that in fact is entirely possible well let me let me ask you this though um, I, and I'll assume that these are new installations rather than um, adding storage or revamped, remodeled installations. These are all brand new installations of PV. Predominantly, yes. Very predominantly, yes. So assuming all that, um, what if I made you king? <clears throat> or a, a benevolent, <laughs> I'm not worthy. Benevolent, I'm not worthy. Uh, benevolent dictator person who could call the shots. Um, then, you know, what, what would you do to get us back to the, the kind of... Accelerated installation we've had we had before. What changes would you make in terms of incentives and other tax breaks? Uh, in terms of regulatory change, what would you do to to you know move the speed back up? Well, I mean, there's a part of me which uh, is I'd like to feel somewhat grounded in reality and understand that net energy metering as great as it was. I mean, I was one of the few people in the industry who was calling for it to be brought to an end back in 2014 and 2015 because it was an incentive that was wildly successful. And I happen to believe that just because you have an incentive for a certain amount of time doesn't mean you should have that incentive in perpetuity. So to argue, well, let's bring back NEM, to me, I just can't make that argument from a number of, of different angles. So I'm not going to say let's bring back NEM because it just that's, that's not where we're at anymore. I mean, uh, let me address it, your question this way. I mean, Tesla came out last week, and their market share has, has dropped off uh, the map largely. Uh, their previous incarnation of Solar City, prior to Tesla under Elon Musk purchasing Solar City back in was 2016. I mean, Solar City was the pathbreaker. They were the dominant kids on the block for a rooftop solar for residential. Uh, under the third party, third party leasing and power purchase agreement framework. And they have since uh, over the past years, their market share has dropped. Sunrun has become number one, Vivint, Sonova, and now uh, Tesla is either number three or number four. And they came up with the idea last week as a way of trying to reinvigorate their market share and getting back into the market of renting, get this Jay, renting the solar electric system to a homeowner where the homeowner is paying nothing out of pocket and instead agrees to have a solar system installed on his or her home where the homeowner is, is paying a monthly rental fee. And I don't know if there's a long-term contract involved, but you know, assuming the rental fee is going to be less than the accrued savings on a monthly basis, because who's going to want to rent a product where they're paying 
where they're not getting commensurate, if not more than commensurate savings on their utility bill. So is, is, you know, is Elon and his team onto something that beyond solar leasing, beyond power purchase agreements, hey, how about renting, how about a homeowner renting, like they rent a couch or rent a lazy boy chair, and maybe with a rent to own possibility, but it is trying to lower the acquisition cost to the homeowner as a way of, of accelerating or trying to increase the, the demand for the product. So, I mean, it's, it's creative, certainly. I hadn't heard of that before, and, you know, as to whether it's going to be successful or not, it's too, too early to tell. Well, it's good, to, it's good to see innovation. But before we leave the subject, and we do have to leave it, I, I wanted to ask you one other thing. You know, these, these numbers and this chart we're talking about is, um, you know, it's this sort of bare data the sense that it's the number of permits issued for the installation of solar. Um, but there are other things changing under the hood all the time. Um, the number of local companies has changed, the local of na national companies that have come into this market has changed, their capitalization has changed. Uh, so many things have changed, and uh, you know, I wonder if you could give us a handle on what is happening under the hood. We have a consolidation here, sure. we have um, an in and out, uh, arrangement where uh, we don't, you know, we, we don't know. Let's take a short break, Marco, and we'll come back and you can answer that question, okay? Sure. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel? Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that would just Talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. Hey, aloha everyone and welcome to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii. We air here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Hawaii time, trying to bring you issues about security that you may not know, issues that can protect your family, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our, our companies, the folks we work with. Uh, please join us and I uh, hope you can um, maybe get a little different perspective on how to live a little safer. Aloha. Energy 808, The Cutting Edge, with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us by remote call from Hilo, Hawaii. So, uh, Marco, the question uh, that we were talking with before the break was all about the changes in the industry as it exists here. Consolidation uh, or the opposite? What do we got going on? So, a couple of quick takeaways, Jay. Uh, one thing that stood out to me is uh, the dominant player in the Hawaii market over the past several years has been a company called Sunrun. They have a strong presence on Oahu, the Big Island, not so on Maui, as far as I know, maybe a little bit on uh, Kauai. Uh, they have seen a significant drop-off in their permit count so far this year for seven months by 62%, uh, according to my data, uh, for Oahu and 57% on the Big Island. Uh, the, the reason for that, I'm really not sure. That's something, of course, that they're not keen to talk about. But uh, what we're seeing is kind of a redivision of the pie as opposed to an expansion of the pie, although the pie is expanded by 3.6% from uh, this year to last year. The other big uh, thing that I love to, to trumpet is that the deployment of energy storage has gone up significantly. Two years ago, that figure was roughly uh, under 30% of all PV systems permitted on Oahu had battery storage, and now we're up to 75% so far this year. So clearly, under 30 to 75, that's uh, that's a monumental increase. That's only going to continue to go up. And uh, the dominant players so far in terms of battery storage residential are Tesla with their Powerwall and uh, LG Chem, a big uh, South Korean conglomerate, with their Resu line, R-E-S-U line. So those are really kind of the two dominant players 
in Hawaii. And interestingly, not surprisingly, those are the two dominant players in the, in the, the Golden State market of California. Well, we've got so, to continue so to cover this, Marco. This is obviously, it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. There's so many things happening, um, and we need to understand it uh, better and better as go, go forward. It's the most promising renewable in the array. Uh, and if we're going to get to our targets, we'd better, we'd better use it and watch it. Let's move on to our second point, though. Our, our second point was um, what is going on with, uh, with uh, P PGV, uh, Pune Geothermal Venture. I mean, we had a, an eruption a year and change ago. Um, it couldn't even get down there because of the road. There was all these uh, issues about when are you going to start again and can you start under the existing power purchase agreement or are we going to have to reorganize the whole thing? So what's the status? It's an ongoing, uh, ongoing saga there, Jay, and it's uh, it's really quite fascinating to me uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, just in the brief history, like you said, PGB was operating pretty much nonstop for 25 years, 1993 roughly to 2018, till the first week of May when they went offline uh, in reaction to a rather serious uh, volcanic eruption and lava flow, as we all know. And now we're August 26th, and uh, the, the power plant is, is still offline. Uh, Helco and Ormat, Ormat being the parent company of Pune Geothermal Venture, uh, their assumption was, has been, that after uh, PGV spending the necessary money to bring the plant back to life, that uh, it was essentially a pretty clear road and path to be able to fire up the plant again and start selling power to Helco, and that uh, that assumption has been uh, now clearly uh, been shattered by the Public Utilities Commission saying not so fast, essentially. And what I mean by that is that there's been discussions and rumors uh, and press coverage that there is a renegotiation taking place between Helco and between PGV regarding what the purchase price is going to be of uh, 25 megawatts, the first 25 megawatts of power output from that plant. Because FYI, uh, ever since PGV has been in operation for decades, uh, those first 25 megawatts have been priced at the so-called avoided cost rate. What's avoided cost? Avoided cost is what Helco, Hico, and Miko determined to be what the if they were to no longer peg, no, excuse me, if they, it is pegged to the cost of oil. So as the cost of oil goes up, the avoided cost payments from the utility company to the power producer goes up, and as they go down, the payments go down. So this particular avoided cost rate structure or price structure was officially banned by our legislature back in 2006, signed by Governor Lingle at the time, and ever since then, what, 12, 13 years ago, there have been no new power purchase agreements that have been at avoided cost. But the first 25 megawatts of, of PGV has been at avoided cost. So as a sweetener, to be able to smooth the uh, power plant going back online, there have been negotiations between Helco and PGV for those first 25 megawatts to take it, uh, to, to, to no longer have it be avoided cost and have it be at a fixed a sensibly lower price that would be more attractive for uh, essentially benefit ratepayers on the Big Island and also make it uh, more palatable to the PUC to approve PGV going back online. Well, compromise so, uh, is always good. Negotiation and compromise is always good. And um, I guess that's the, those elements of compromise sound reasonable. What's the problem? Well, the key takeaway here is that the commission is effectively saying we will wait before we allow PGV to come back online until we will wait until we have a fully completed and submitted to us the PC because this is all, of course, subject to uh, regulatory approval. We will wait until you, Helco, and you, PGV, provide us with a completed new power purchase agreement for those first 25 megawatts. So the assumption on the part of Hawaiian Electric has been up until last week that they would be able to move forward with going back online at some point in the not too distant future or so they hope as they continue to negotiate with PGV to come up with a done deal contract. And the commission essentially says, no, we are not going to give you the green light to move forward until you 
provide us a completely negotiated, finalized PPA for those first 25 megawatts so that we will review and approve or not approve whether those terms are acceptable and in the public interest. Well, I can see this is going to affect the timeline because those steps take time. But how does it affect the, the future of PGV? Um, is, this, is this a good, you know, can this be a good thing for PGV? Or does this, is this some sort of um, death knell for PGV? It's, it's, it's not good news. I don't think anybody can spin it as good news because, I mean, by my rough calculation, uh, Puna Geothermal Venture and Ormat is losing about $3 million a month in terms of lost revenue due to not being able to sell power for Halco. And, you know, you, you, you add that up over month after month after month, I mean, that adds up to some real money. And Ormat is a you know, fairly big company, but uh, how much can they continue to, how long can they continue to sustain loss of $3 million a month revenue? And I have no idea how long any type of business interruption uh, insurance continues, you know, it doesn't continue in perpetuity, I can't, can't imagine. So, no, no, it's definitely not good news. And this definitely, from what I can tell, pushes out any possibility of PGV coming back online yeah. until sometime next year. Mm. Sometime next yeah, they year. They want to do it at the end of this year, but I guess that's off the table right now. That, is, that, that seems, strikes me as completely off the table. Yeah. Yeah, so one one other thing is that we, you know, we have uh, protesters, uh, Native Hawaiian protesters, top of Mauna Kea. And for a long time, there were Native Hawaiian protesters protesting PGV on the basis that it was uh, piercing Pelly's breast and all those uh, issues. Um, and, I, and, I, and I wonder if those protesters are also targeting PGV. Um, do, do, do we have a, an unresolved cultural conflict here? I have heard absolutely nothing about any protester protectors being in the vicinity of, of PGV, Not, nothing. So I think the the, the attraction surely is Mauna Kea as opposed to as opposed to what may happen in the future regarding Puna Geothermal Venture. Okay, well let's move on to our third point. And I guess this relates to an article you sent me entitled Hawaii Public Utilities Commission Transforming Electricity Sector. Uh, can you talk about that article and um, you know, what, you know, summarize it and what it means in terms of the future? Sure. I just uh, give a shout out to our friend Henry Curtis, first of all, because he uh, he's one of those folks who's working in the trenches day in, day out, you know, keeping the public informed of uh, energy happenings uh, across the state and, and the, the Public Utilities Commission and so forth. So, you know, it's thanks to Henry and his diligence and his dedication. So I uh, again want to give a shout out to, to Henry. And Henry is uh, sharing today uh, amongst those people on his distribution list that uh, was titled Hawaii PUC Transforming Electricity Sector. And uh, I, I think he's absolutely right on that uh, this particular Public Utilities Commission of uh, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, and Leo Asensio uh, are truly a uh, exemplar as far as I'm concerned in my you know decades of um, being in the trenches here, an exemplar as far as a commission that is super thoughtful, uh, very progressive, very proactive, and very very much getting it, the it being what needs to be done in this state in terms of the clean energy transformation at a rate that we can afford to do so. So that's kind of the, you know, the broad brush strokes of uh, what's going on at the, the, the macro level. But, you know, in the trenches, as we've talked about before, the, the performance-based regulation is uh, the most important docket before the commission. And uh, it's going to continue to take time uh, in terms of an actual decision and order. I and mean, we're easily a year and a half out, I think, if not longer. But, you know, this is going to reshape the utility landscape uh, for Hawaiian Electric out here. And, and I think that's a good thing. There's also the so-called integrated grid planning, or IGP, which is looking holistically at forecasting, planning, procuring, combination of energy solutions to solve the needs of the entire system uh, in terms of generation transmission, generation transmission distribution, so-called non-wire alternatives behind the meter storage and so forth and so on. So in addition to that uh, microgrid, you know, being able to establish uh, uh, clumps in the grid where you're able to keep the power on when, let's say, due to natural disasters, trees across power lines, 
uh, lava flow and so forth that part of the grid is taken down but not the whole grid so it all goes towards greater robustness and resiliency of our grid so that's certainly a good thing and then uh, the, the big news of last week which was uh, Hawaiian Electric putting out a request for proposals uh, for uh, as much as 600 megawatts 600 uh, million watts of renewable power generation across the five Hawaiian Electric Service territories which would include a tremendous amount of storage as well. So just a, a lot going on, and, and it's really exciting to uh, you know, to be a small spectator and a small uh, observer and a small participant like I consider myself and my company and other solar rooftop solar companies, and uh, I just feel a tremendous uh, enthusiasm and gratitude that we do have uh, more and more people at the top positions of of decision-making bodies who really care deeply and who really get it. Well, you know, one so thing you, you, um, you, know, you mentioned that uh, the utility, uh, Hawaiian Electric, is uh, doing these large uh, photovoltaic uh, arrays and all that. Uh, are those permits included uh, in the chart we looked at earlier in this program? Uh, Utility-scale solar is included in the list of permits issued by Department of Planning and Permitting, but we're talking about you know, a handful of permits for these big mega systems. So, you know, if you have a system that's going in 30 megawatts, it's not, you know, 100 permits. So, it's going to be yeah, one so you have to evaluate that chart on the, uh, with, with understanding that some some few of those permits um, could represent hundreds of megawatts. Uh, Correct. That, that's something we could talk about going forward. Yeah, the other thing uh, that, that strikes me is that, uh, you know, and, and there have been so many articles about climate change, so many indicia of climate change coming faster than we thought, um, you know, and uh, on the national scale, we're not moving fast enough to achieve renewables, and um, it's a real problem. It's a problem for this country in terms of energy policy. Um, it's a problem for the world, and of course, Hawaii has been doing its part, but, but the question I put to you, Marco, with, with all of that, with all the optimism that you know we can find in in, in our place here in the sun, um, are we moving fast enough? Uh, can we move Absolutely faster? Not. Yeah, absolutely. Not. Go ahead. No, I mean, um, you know, you you, th you think back to the signing of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, which is my goodness, already eleven years ago, and mm -hmm. you had uh, Connie Lau from HEI, you had Governor Lingle, you had people from the Fed. And it was, um, you know, it was a, kind of a key marker. And what have we done in the past 11 years? Well, we've definitely made progress. But uh, I feel a greater, much greater sense of urgency, not only in our state but in our country and, and on a planetary basis, to, uh, that the progress has to go further, faster, deeper, further, faster, deeper. And uh, we're, we're not keeping up with what needs to be done. There needs to be change agents kind of at all aspects of, um, uh, of the of the matrix to use uh, uh, Neo, Neo uh, going back to the, the Matrix films uh, 20 years or so again, or 20 years or so ago, there needs to be change agents and what I call visionary disruptors at many more key nodes of the matrix. And uh, there are not that many of them out there. I mean, it takes a lot like an Elon Musk or a Bill Gates and you know, fill in the blank. Well, and it takes parallel, the parallel change agents right here in the state of Hawaii. And uh, I think in our discussions here on Monday on Energy 808, the cutting edge, uh, we should talk about the companies and the individuals who are the change agents. For that matter, the uh, government officials and organizations that are the change agents. And going forward, we ought to do what we can and say what we need to say to, to keep the pressure on, to keep moving ahead, uh, to realize our goals in a timely fashion. And that's what Energy 808 is all about. Right, Marco? I'm speechless, Jay. I couldn't have put it better. I just I'm 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 ashamed at my my inarticulateness uh, compared to yours. <laughs> and on that note, on that note, we're going to have to close the show. <laughs> I, I can't handle any more. <laughs> Thank you, Marco Mangelsdorf. Thank you for the show. Thank you for these great discussions. I look forward to Parting talking is, with you again soon. Parting is such sweet sorrow, but uh, I will I will be assuaged by uh, knowing it won't be forever. Well, there was one good thing about it, no doubt, and that is at no time during the show that, that either of us sing anything. So thank you so much, Marco. Mahalo, my friend. Mahalo.